Hello, I'm John Steiff, a representative of the Shaw Media Editorial Board. Today is Friday, September 4th, and we're pleased to begin a joint interview with the candidates of the 63rd and 64th Illinois State House races in the November 2020 election. I'm joined by the Daily Herald's Jim Bauman and reporter Sam Lounsbury of the Northwest Herald. We welcome the candidates, uh, incumbent Steve Reich and uh, challenger Brian Sager and also incumbent Tom Weber and challenger Leslie Armstrong McLeod. Mr. Reich, we'll start the questions with you. COVID-19 will have an impact on the state's finances. What specific measures will you push to make sure the state does not fall further into debt? Starting off, I think that the uh the fact that we didn't do a lot in the way of trimming the state budget when this hit uh i think was a was an indication that the state um didn't get it right when it started uh when this whole thing started other states around us in fact did cut payroll and things like that we didn't do that uh we had to borrow significant amounts of money that has to be paid back to the federal government because of uh the decline in our um in our economy. Um, my major uh, focus is going to be on be, being sensible with our budget items so that we can pay this money back without having to go to the taxpayers for that. For that. Uh, I'm not gonna count on the federal government waiving payback of, this, of these loans, of, of this money we're borrowing for the next fiscal year. Mr. Sager. Well, first off, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you all today. I'm grateful for this uh, chance to visit and to address some of the important issues in the state of Illinois. With regards to uh, COVID, I would concur that uh, we have taken a very aggressive approach in my mind to try to uh, meet the needs that we are responsible for meeting as a state. And so I applaud that effort and I truly am grateful uh, for the uh, extension of support that has been given for our businesses, for our municipalities, our counties, uh, as we have moved forward. Mr. Reich is correct in the fact that we did not uh, look to trim other areas of the budget, but I think the fact is that we know full well that the ongoing programs of the state are incredibly important and we can't just begin to say, all right, we're going to eliminate those programs in order to be able to cover these costs. Now, I'm a strong fiscal conservative and I understand that you do have to meet your obligations. So I, I am trusting and I am hoping beyond hope that uh, we will be able to work in a very strongly collaborative manner with the federal government to see some reimbursement. But at the same time, I acknowledge the fact that these costs, these expenses are going to be carried over into the coming fiscal year as well. And so that does mean that we're going to have to be incredibly uh, cognizant of the need to try to uh, be responsible and to trim costs where we can to make sure that we are able to uh, accommodate these expenses. Uh, that's exactly what we're doing in the municipality. We are looking at our bottom line. We are making sure that we are planning ahead and prepared for reducing costs where we can, as we can, not for essential services at all, but where we can and for we can in uh, those areas that are going to make it uh, possible. So I concur that it's really essential that as we meet these needs uh, in the future, that we look to doing so in a very fiscally responsible manner. Representative Weber. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I think that we need to look back at our uh, budget from last year, uh, any new spending programs. I think we need to form a uh, committee um, task force to look at those items to see which one of them do need to be funded and which ones that we should wait or could, or could hold off. Um, I think also that, you know, that we're slowly going back into winter and with the shutdown and the damage to many of our small businesses, obviously revenues dropped. Um, from the state, from lack of sales and stuff like that. I think we also need to um, sit down in Springfield, um, the legislature, and come up with uh, plans where uh, more businesses would be able to fall under the essential category and be able to operate safely um, so that those revenues uh, do continue through winter just in case there is another um, wave of uh, hospitalizations which uh, you know have to close down businesses again. Ms. 
Armstrong McLeod. Hi, thank you, everyone. Um, I agree with everything that's been said prior. Obviously, this has been an unprecedented time for us in this country, in this area. Um, the businesses have been hard hit. People have been hard hit. Um, we are going to need to work in Springfield to look at the budget and be very cognizant of what we're doing down there. Um, as far as, you know, we're looking at committees and things to help the businesses, to help the people. I, I, I certainly hope that that is something that we're going to continue to do and to look at ways that we can help individuals. Okay. Uh, I'm Jim Bauman. I'm the managing editor of the uh, Daily Herald. And uh, welcome. Uh, my question is, is kind of a two-parter. Local property taxes continue to, to rise and uh, be the primary funding source for public schools. Uh, first, what should be done to manage those rising taxes? And is the proposed graduated income tax a good answer to that? Uh, I'm going to go in reverse order. So, uh, Leslie, for you. Um, I work for a school district, so this is something that um, we very cognizant about in the school district. We've been watching property taxes going up and up for all of our people. Um, we are in the highest taxed area um, in my district in Grace Lake where I work. Um, so we're very aware of that. The um, funding that came out of the state recently has been a help to us. The evidence-based funding has been a help that it, it does not quite go far enough. So we are hoping that the state uh, can work, we can work to make that even stronger. And I do believe that the fair tax would be of great benefit to all the school districts and the property tax. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Weber. Uh, hi, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the you know, tax for education in uh, our area for property taxes is around 70%. And Lake and McHenry counties are the two highest tax uh, counties in the state of Illinois. Um, I think we need to definitely uh, fully fund our education system. Um, I think we also need to look at ways where um, we can open it up so local governments can try to operate more efficiently, um, sharing and purchasing, stuff like that, which many of them are doing. Um, as far as the um, progressive tax, um, absolutely not, I do not uh, agree with that. I think a flat tax system where we are all paying the same rate is the only thing that has kept the property tax or, or the income tax rate as low as it has been. Um, because politicians know that if they raise it, they're raising it for everyone. Um, I think it also opens the door for new taxes and those rates that are proposed are temporary. Those rates can be changed with a simple majority vote. And you know, it all depends on who's looking at who's wealthy at the time when they vote on that. So uh, no, I do not support it. I think it will drive more people and more businesses out of our state. I did notice that uh, Ken Griffin, the richest man in the state, uh, just put $20 million toward fighting graduated income tax, which is interesting. Um, uh, Mr. Sager. Well, certainly there's no question about the fact that the uh, single primary issue among taxpayers in our district our rising property taxes and our educational bill is the largest portion of that. Uh, that is secondary, I think, to uh, ethics and uh, integrity in government, but that certainly is the top priority. I am incredibly pleased with the fact that the state legislature did take uh, action relative to evidence-based uh, uh, formula and I think that that was the most appropriate way for us to look at funding education. Of course, there are some uh, additional uh, areas of um, quality opportunity that exists for various districts based upon uh, the ability of those districts to evidence uh, their accessibility and their capacity, and we need to continue those particular formulas. The fact that the state legislature also did say that they were going to uh, accommodate 350 to 375 million dollars on an annual basis to provide increased funding for education is an incredibly fine step in the right direction. The question is though still how do we pay for it? And so I truly believe that the fair or graduated income tax is the appropriate way to move forward. Not only is it appropriate relative to uh, lower income uh, households as well as higher income households, taxing them at incredibly appropriate uh, levels. But the other thing that it does is it is 
uh, considered on a marginal basis. And so I do believe that that's the right way. The concern, of course, as has been expressed by uh, um, Representative Weber, is the fact that you have to be able to control that. And so I think in enabling legislation, you must take a look at methodologies to do that because we don't want to get into a, a runaway train situation. Nonetheless, I do believe that a fair or graduated income tax is the way to ultimately provide stabilization for funding in both education and in the pension system. Very good. Thanks. Representative Wright. You're muted. Is that better? That's better. Sorry about that. Um, I practiced tax law for over 30 years, and I started when rates were as high as 90% on the federal level. I've been a flat tax person all my life. And uh, I don't see how moving to a graduated income tax in Illinois is going to do anything to help uh, our, our taxing system. Uh, the Constitution provided for a flat tax uh, per specifically to address the fact that the states around us were all graduated income tax states. It was an advantage at that time, but we need tax reform now, and it doesn't revolve around making higher rates on a particular type of tax that maybe doesn't track the economy as well as a, a, a whole new mix of taxes. We need tax reform, but we need a tax system that tracks the, the development and the, and the growth in the economy, because a growing economy is the only way we're going to get ourselves out of this. The, the, the graduated income tax proposal that the governor is pushing uh, with 50 or 70 million of his own um, dollars, depending up, uh, upon who you listen to, uh, Ken Griffin's 20 kind of pales in comparison. Um, the fact is, is that we need a tax system that tracks the growth in the economy and allows the economy to grow and we gain, uh, we gain revenue as a result of that. Um, education, the Constitution says that the, uh, that the um, primary responsibility for paying of education rests with the state. That has long, that, that, that ship has sailed unless we're willing to go back in and do substantive changes to the entire tax structure that brings into account the cost of public education. Uh, we can't continue to spend over 25% of our general revenue to pay down past pension debt. That has to be addressed and it's not being addressed adequately in, in the, the state legislature either. So, you know, this is, this is not a one, this is not a one type thing. We've got a moral, there's a moral hazard here as well, because if we pass the graduated income tax, People are going to think that we've solved the problem. We will, we will not have solved the problem. What we're going to end up with is the same problem coming back with one less, with, with, with fewer tools to fix it. So uh, I'm against the graduated income tax because I don't think it will work. The governor has said he's going to put 200 million of what he raises in addition uh, as a result of that toward the pension. That's a rounding error in what we're putting into pensions right now. We need a, a, a global examination of it, of, of our expenditures. We need a global examination of how we pay for education. And I did vote for the, um, for the evidence-based funding model. There was a lot not to like, but there was an awful lot to like in that. So um, we, we, we've, got, we've got work to do. We're not addressing the problems as they exist, um, but that comes as a result of, uh, we, uh, of having people who control the agenda in, in the legislature. And, Frankly, good ideas sometimes don't make it out of the um, out of the rules committee, so that we can start addressing these things in an adult way. I'm I'm willing to work with people on both sides of the aisle and have done so, but the fact is is that we have got to have something that actually moves our economy ahead and brings our tax revenue along for the ride and will increase in order to address our growing fiscal problems. That's it can't be done with just one thing, and the graduated income tax is not it. Okay, thank you. John Stife with the Northwest Herald and Shaw Media. Um, again, uh, AJ Friend's death has highlighted the failings of Illinois' DCFS system. What steps need to be taken to fix the child welfare system? And we'll start with you, Brian Sager. 
But what a tragic situation and circumstance uh, that was. That was very local for us in uh, our district and in our region. And so our, our uh, true, true uh, condolences go out to that particular situation and the loss of that child. Of course, I think we have to recognize the fact that our uh, DCF system uh, has some incredible challenges, not the least of which is the ability to pro properly fund uh, for personnel. It takes a huge commitment of personnel in order to be able to address and to track uh, circumstances which need to be constantly and routinely oversighted and reviewed. And we simply failed in that regard. And I understand there are challenges trying to uh, budget in a given year and a given circumstance, but we must absolutely understand that child welfare provides the care and concern and oversight for our greatest resource, our youth. And we need to make sure that we are dedicating the funds to do that. You know, the other aspect of it is frankly that I think that we have fallen uh, woefully short in the state of Illinois with regards to upholding uh, funding for uh, mental uh, health concerns and conditions. I trust and believe that there is a relationship there. And I think that that's another area that we need to work at funding. And it does require that we not only make a commitment, but that we determine to prioritize the funding for this particular situation. Uh, the other thing I believe is that we need to take very aggressive steps. When a circumstance as tragic as this does take place, we need as a state to commit ourselves to following through with a very, very rapid collaborative effort uh, between DCFS so that we have open uh, dialogue about that particular circumstance and our law enforcement to ensure that we are rapidly and quickly uh, setting the tone that this is something in the state of Illinois that we will not, cannot tolerate, and we're gonna take a different course. Representative Steve Reich. This is an issue that has uh, sort of consumed me for the last year. Right after AJ's death, he was buried less than two miles from my house. And so I took this kind of personally. I sat on a working group for over a year where we did a deep dive into DCFS and I came away with the inescapable conclusion that this is not an agency that should be run on a statewide basis. As a result, I filed HB 4886, which is a bill that would establish a, McKen a pilot program here in McHenry County paid for with state funds to replace DCFS with a McHenry County Child Welfare Agency. We have an issue, of, uh, our, our state's attorney wrote a letter to me uh, back in October of last year that spelled it out real well. He said, you know, we've got agencies here in McHenry County, the Child Advocacy Center, the CASAs, the courts, the first responders, police, teachers, first uh, manda mandated reporters, all of whom are responsible to the county, to the people in their jurisdictions. So what, but, but in the meantime, what we have is a state agency that is plopped down right in the middle of it that has a process system that is more, in, uh, more interested in following the processes that it established instead of the mission of protecting children. I think that what we need to have is, a, is an agency, a countywide agency in this case, in, in the case of McHenry County, uh, or uh, a system based upon uh, the boundaries of judicial circuits where all of those players are talking and responsible to the same constituency. And my bill, what it, it broad bipartisan support, and every time we turn around and find another dead child in another district, I pick up another co-sponsor. We've what, what, what I'm trying to do is establish a means by which we can sort of decentralized DCFS, do away with it ultimately if this pilot program works and move DCFS or the child welfare system into, uh, uh, into conformity with the, uh, with the jurisdiction in which uh, it, uh, it, it operates. We're different than Cook County. We're different than Southern Illinois. We have different needs. We have different um, uh, priorities. CAC and DCFS sign an agreement that dictates the, the procedures that will apply within the boundaries of that child advocacy center. That shows that there are regional differences between what DCFS is doing on a statewide basis and what needs to be done within our communities. 
And my my pledge, and I'm going to take this bill. It didn't it didn't go forward in during this session because of the COVID thing. But my plan is next next session, I'm going to reintroduce that bill, and I dare say I'm going to end up with 20 or 25 or 30 co-sponsors from both sides of the aisle who want to see this agency fixed. So um, stay tuned, folks. And you can go uh, you can go to my website and uh, ilikereich.com and hear an interview that I did just last week uh, on this on this very issue. Uh, this is the biggest issue. This is this issue is resonating strongly in this county and needs to continue to be addressed on a local basis. Leslie Armstrong McLeod. I agree that um, DCFS is woefully underfunded and understaffed, and the workload that they have is is immeasurable. Honestly, this is the first I'm hearing of uh, Mr. Reich's plan, and I got to say, I think it's very interesting plan, and I would definitely welcome hearing more about that. I think anything that we can do to assist parents, mental health professionals, anything that we can do to shine more light on this issue would be welcome by all. Representative Tom Weber. Um, yeah, this has been something that's uh, um, really horrified and frightened and concerned residents all across our district. As uh, if you don't know, um, AJ lived in our district. Um, I have met with uh, many advocacy groups. Um, I went to his wake. Um, I went to his house. I met people from out of state that all came um, just because how sad the story was and to pay their respects. Um, this child had contact, like many others, um, with DCFS over the years. She was originally removed from the mother due to drugs. Um, and there were reports that she was still on drugs, but yet the child stayed in the household. I think we need to. Um, especially with opiates. Um, we know that on the first time that someone goes into rehab, it's, you know, that's part of the process, but normally people don't recover, um, usually till the seventh to 11th time through treatment. Um, sending a child home after he say it, you know, says something that says, you know, maybe mommy hit me and maybe mommy didn't mean to hurt me. And yet they still send the children home without investigation. Um, it, it, it's horrible what happened to this child. 123 other children who had contact in 2019 also lost their lives. I think this is a systemic problem uh, with the whole agency, and I think the whole agency needs to be re reformed. Um, until that happens, um, I did file um, HB uh, 5281, which is uh, AJ's law. And what that would do, if you've ever read the uh, Illinois uh, Abused and Neglected Child uh, Reporting Act. Um, it states that the jurisdiction of investigating something in the home or uh, abuse to a child, if it is someone that lives within the household, a boyfriend or direct family member, the only people with jurisdiction is DCFS, not the police. What my bill would do is open it up for oversight so that those cases would have to be reported also to the police and that they would have an option of going out and doing an independent investigation. Because we need to do something immediately to protect these children. Um, it's horrible what happened. Uh, I know that we're, you know, I spent some time out at the courthouse before the mother's hearing. I do not think that 35 years is enough to punish someone for beating their child to death with a shower head. I, it's, it's horrible if you listen to the testimony and um, I will continue to fight to do whatever it is to protect the children uh, that have contact with DCFS and to try to reform the agency so that they are more active and that there's definitely more local oversight of people that understand those areas and understand the district. Thanks. Let me jump in with an ethics question here. Everyone's favorite topic. Uh, so what are the most important aspects of that you see in legislative ethics reform uh, and, and 
what role will you play in getting those uh, done? Let's start with uh, Brian Sager. Well, I want to quickly say uh, in response to the, the last question, I applaud the creativity of the uh, current seated representatives in terms of addressing uh, that issue relative to child welfare. My concern is to have differing perspectives on a local basis, a one locality or area or region from another. I just think that that's the wrong approach. I think that we have to have significant reform across the board with DCFS and would support that. With regards to the, the, the question on the table and ethics, uh, I, there's no question about the fact that this is a major concern of, of our constituencies, of people throughout the state of Illinois. Illinois has uh, unfortunately kind of fallen prey to some significant uh, uh, unethical behavior, uh, incredibly dishonest behavior, and so we have gained a reputation, which I think is uh, a very, very sad scenario. I think there are three things that we need to really work on. The first thing is I believe that we need to uh, remove the ability for the legislature to kind of uh, guard or protect its own house relative to ethics. Right now, that is a situation. I think that that oversight and review needs to be turned over to the attorney general's office. And I think that we need to take quick and uh, very aggressive action to do just that. We also need to make sure that we are appropriately and fully uh, guarding against uh, individuals who lead the legislature and go immediately out into a lobby. Now, there has been some action taken. I'm grateful for that on behalf of the legislature, but I think we need to tighten things up uh, very quickly uh, with regards to a revolving door policy. And that would simply say that once you're in the state legislature, you are prohibited for a minimum, an absolute minimum, immediately upon uh, retirement or uh, leaving the legislature of uh, 10 years before you can engage. And I just think that that would help uh, things significantly. The other thing that I believe that we need to do is to truly address the training. You know, right now there's an ethics training that we're kind of all uh, required to go through if you're in public office and uh, that training is online. Uh, I understand that it does introduce the basics, but there's really no solid dialogue about one, the significance of what inappropriate unethical behavior do. Uh, does. It's not just a cost factor, but it truly, it truly puts a pall upon everyone so that we have individuals out there in the state of Illinois who would be exceptional public servants, but they are simply afraid to become engaged because of the ethical uh, considerations, because of the ethical problems that we have had, and they don't want to live under that constant microscope and to deal with the uh, challenges associated with all of the accusations, et cetera. So I am really, really concerned about the fact that the individuals, because of their families, because of their business reputations, who are good quality people out there, cannot serve because they are very, very concerned. And I think that's a loss to the state of Illinois. So we've got to bring this under control. And I'm, I'm very, very supportive of taking aggressive steps to ensure that individuals are properly trained. They know what ethics is about. They understand it and they can explain it. So those are the three areas that I believe that we need to address. Uh, Representative Stephen Reich, uh, please also address the issue of whether, uh, uh, of lobbyists, you know, whether uh, uh, departing members of the legislature can become lobbyists and when. You're muted again, sir. Um, sorry about that. I keep putting myself on mute. Um, I don't have a problem with legislators being prohibited from lobbying. I have no intention when I leave the legislature to, to head back down to Springfield and hang on the rail. Um, I think that um, the mayor's uh, suggestion about the attorney general uh, having oversight on legislative ethics shows the fact that he's kind of unaware of the fact that we have a legislative inspector general whose job it is to do those kind of things, but that uh, uh, post was vacant for a number of years uh, because the speaker chose to keep it vacant. He would not appoint somebody to the Legislative Ethics Commission. We came up, the Republicans came up with a lot of really good suggestions of people who would fill that role act just very, very well, but um, no action was taken until the Me Too movement started, and we started having to, the speaker had to address the issue, and one of those things was to finally appoint a legislative inspector general. 
ethics, ethics is, you know, my idea of ethics is if you wouldn't do it in front of your grandma, or if you wouldn't say it in front of your grandma, don't do it, don't say it. Um, you know, that gets, to the, that gets to the notion of the way you behave in public. As far as the ethical things dealing with lobbying and, and the ComEd thing and all that, um, we're going to find out what the speaker knew and when he knew it. We're going to find out under this uh, 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 motion that was filed, just the petition that was just filed a day or so ago, uh, to get to the bottom of this. Um, it's a rule that is, exists in the House rules, and we're going to find out what kind of ethical uh, lapses were uh, occurred up and down the line. Um, you know, ComEd, this, this ComEd uh, deferred prosecution agreement is not allegations. This deferred prosecution agreement is admissions. We did this. We did this. This person participated. This person cooperated. These are the things that we are going to get to the bottom of hopefully soon. But the fact is, is that when you've got one party rule in this state and they've got a super majority on, in both houses and are able to control the rules, the, the house rules are written in a way to guarantee the primacy of the majority party. So, you know, um, the, the proper question is, should be put to the people who actually control the process in the House of Representatives, and that's the guys on the other side. They're the ones who are making all these decisions, and that's why we end up with a, a situation where advantage is being taken of the situations that develop, and nothing is ever done about it. So, you know, ethics is, ethics is something, uh, ethics is, 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 is culture. Eth ethics is what you believe. Ethics is what you do when nobody's looking. And the fact is, is that in the, in the dark places that Mike Madigan has, has created within state government to be, allow these things to happen, sunshine needs to be brought, uh, brought to bear on this stuff. But the fact is, is that, you know, it seems all too often that what happens is the um, uh, ethics questions are brought up and the solutions, air quote solutions that come out of this are written by the people who are most, most likely to be the ones who have taken advantage of it. So that's, that's my take on ethics. Okay, thank you. Um, Leslie Armstrong McLeod, to you. I, I do agree with all of that. And this has been, ethics has been a long standing issue in the state, obviously for a long, long time. Um, at, you know, everything that's been said, the legislative inspector general that um, needs to be looked at, strengthening his position to be able to investigate what's been going on, um, a process for censure and removal if necessary. Um, I would certainly hope that in recent years, at least the legislature has seemed to be moving in a in a better direction as far as bringing in more voices into the process and i would hope that the leader in the party would realize that this state needs to move along into a, a new a new era we need new vision we need new voices we need things to progress um so that would be my hope for sure that um that comes about, whether that comes through rules and removal or whether he comes to that decision on his own, I, I would hope that that happens. Um, as far as lobbyists are concerned, I don't see why legislators need to be lobbyists at all. I think that should just not even be allowed. And uh, that's my take on that. Okay. Thank you. Representative Tom Weber. Uh, thank you. Um, so Michael Bannigan, in my opinion, needs to step down. If this was a private corporation with allegations like this, I don't think stockholders um, would stand for it. And at least until the investigation is over, um, I think that would make sense. And I think that would uh, make Illinois residents uh, so a little more at ease. Um, and I think maybe I have a little benefit of coming from Lake County government. Uh, we had a lot of anti-nepotism in uh, um, rules. Uh, in our rules where, you know, even if I had wrote, written a recommendation for someone looking to get a job at the county, if I did that, they would never get the job because we wanted to keep that out of people getting favors from elected officials. Um, 
I also sat on the Government Reform and Implementation Committee, which worked on an independent fair map commission. Um, I do not know where that's at now in the last two years. Uh, things have changed on the county board. However, I think that when you look at the boundaries, especially with District 64 and other districts, um, you can tell that they're uh, politically laid out. Um, the, uh, you know, if we have um, independent people um, from different areas of our communities, um, because they're, you know, very diverse, uh, I think we could end up with maps that make sense. As far as lobbying, absolutely not. When I found out that there were actually sitting legislators that were also lobbyists, it was repulsive that that could happen. I honestly uh, was shocked about that. Um, besides the fact of that, I think um, enhanced disclosure forms, uh, because I also found when I was down there, or I didn't find, but I found out that um, there were representatives' wives who were, who were getting appointments and getting hiring. And it seems to be something that's happened for years. Um, it's time for things to change. Uh, residents are fed up. Uh, the number one thing um, as far as ethics that residents of my district uh, responded to was term limits. I think we absolutely need term limits and at least uh, two years after someone, if not more, um, to become a lobbyist after being a representative. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. All right, we have one final question, a simple one. What makes you stand out as the better candidate in your race? And we'll go back to Representative Tom Weber to start this one. Um, so I, you know, I love my district. I really do. Um, the hardest thing for me for COVID, um, has been not being able to go out in public. That is kind of my favorite thing. You know, we go down to Springfield and, you know, a lot of people think we fight, but 90% of the time, you know, we all are in agreement and we are working for the people of Illinois. You know, obviously you don't see that in the news. It's more of the times when we're fighting that, you know, come up in the papers. Um, but when I'm home, going out and hearing um, what residents have to say, um, how businesses are interacting, um, how, how they're being affected by things in Springfield. Um, you know, I've been able to work on a lot of different things. So flooding has been a huge issue in our area and for the Chain of Lakes region. Um, last year, you know, there was very little boating because of the flooding. Um, Jan back in January, I had initiated a meeting with Army Corps of Engineers, IDNR, Fox Waterway, to try to address these issues and you know to look at ways where when we see rain in Wisconsin um, or coming in the future should you know are we pre-lowering the water levels so that every time it rains we don't have to shut down the Fox chain which hurts every business you know it generates about 150 million dollars a year in tourism um, and recreational fees for local businesses and it's been devastated over the years so um, that was one thing we've done and this is the first year in five years that the Fox Water or the Chain of Lakes area has been open every single day since May, um, which has been huge to help, especially with the damage done by the shutdown to our local businesses. Um, secondly, we, you know, I met a lady whose son was killed in a DUI accident. Um, I was on CBS News. Uh, they did an interview with me uh, a few months back, and that was uh, because Wisconsin is not part of the. Um, driver's license compact, which is where states, when someone has a driving incident, they report it to the state where the person lives. Wisconsin is not a member of that. So because her son was killed in a car accident or a crash with uh, someone that lived in Illinois, Wisconsin had never reported that. So while her son was dead and he was waiting for trial in Wisconsin, he was putting Facebook pictures of himself in front of his new car up, up on Facebook, still driving around. Um, it's horrible. Um, if you Google Sheila Lockwood, she's, she is out there fighting every day. And I've tried working together with a, a representative in the Wisconsin legislature to try to convince them uh, to join the compact. Um, and and it is law. Um, just, you know, I, I will continue to fight to um, have oversight over DCFS and try to change that so children in our communities are safer and that we have better people looking out for them. Um, I will continue to fight and do everything we can. In my office, anyone that walks in, you know, we do everything we can to help them. Um, in my, uh, our time down in between people calling, my assistant reg regularly looks through the iCash system, 
And I don't know how many residents, I'll actually try to find that number, but we have found hundreds of thousands of dollars for residents in our district. Um, so we're constantly working, trying to help people. Um, I have a great staff and I'm committed to do whatever it takes to uh, help the residents, help our business and to fight for our community. Thank you. Leslie Armstrong McLeod. As a first time candidate, uh, this whole process for running for election has, has been eye opening to me. Um, I'm a introverted person by nature. I'm not a super outgoing person. So knocking on doors, meeting people was outside of my comfort zone and um, something that it was, again, eye opening to, uh, to talk to the people in the district. And most people that I have talked to in the district have said that they're not really listen to that they've contacted Tom's office and they don't respond or they don't get back to them. And it, it's troubling because I've heard that a lot. Um, I've never received a mailing from Tom, even, you know, uh, public paid mailings. I've, I've never received anything. Um, I drive past his office daily and I've never seen you in there, Tom. Um, I would really relish the opportunity to work for the state to work for the people in my district. Uh, something that the people have always asked is, you know, where do you stand on positions? And I say, well, you know, my beliefs and feelings align with the Democratic Party, but I'm going to Springfield to represent the people of District 64. And their thoughts and beliefs and feelings may not necessarily be in line with what I think and feel. So I'm going to represent the people of this district, not myself. We need to work to get people first, people before profits. I understand business community is important, but the people that live here are important and they need to be heard. And I'm hoping that I will have the opportunity to make their voices heard in Springfield. Thank you. Representative Steve Reich. I'm gonna answer this on both a macro and a micro level. On the macro level, um, I'm a better candidate because right now uh, I am in a position where I have gained the trust of people on both sides of the aisle. And I'll tell you what, when you're a member of a super minority party and you want to get something accomplished, you have to do it by reaching out to people on the other side of the aisle who have similar interests and who can be talked into listening to you and saying, you know, you've got a good idea here. My DCFS bill is, is one of those things. Uh, I was responsible for basically changing uh, a, a mental, uh, a, a gun violence restraining order bill from a disaster that was going to be nothing but gun confiscation to a mental health bill that kept people safe from doing harm to themselves and others while protecting civil liberties. And that came as a result of very strong bipartisan support. I'm, I've, got the, uh, I've got the ability to work with people from a super minority standpoint because my ideas are not so uh, out, of, out of line with the, with the needs of the people of Illinois that other people aren't willing to listen. I'm also uh, not afraid to speak, as they say, truth to power. I'm a member of the Joint Commission on Administrative Rules. And as a member of JCAR, uh, it's my responsibility to see that rules that are written in interpretation of statute don't change the statute. We've had two instances of that this, this summer, dealing with governor's emergency orders on trying to turn business owners into criminals, which we pushed back successfully in May, but were not able to do so uh, this past month. On the micro level, I am proud of the constituent service that my office provides. We do not hide behind voicemail. We answer the phone. We answer the phone, we respond to emails. You don't know, I, 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 I would ask if a man in the street interviews of anybody who's had contact with my office knows that my, my legislative office here in Woodstock is very active. We, we have fielded, I don't know how many calls on the Department of Employment Security. And even though the state has moved on to what they call a phone-in system to report the fact that you're not getting your benefits, we've got, a back, we've got a backdoor system in my office where we are still contacting IDES personally and saying, this guy needs help. 
So, you know, we're, we are very proactive in the community uh, with regard to constituent service. We've, uh, per we've performed, you know, we've done a lot of events here, shred events, prescription jog pick pickups, senior fairs, that kind of thing. And it's really gratifying when you walk into the grocery store and even though you're wearing a mask, somebody recognizes you and say, hey, you know, um, I was at your shred event last week and thanks for doing that. Um, I had a problem with IDES and your legislative aid went an extra mile to get my benefits reinstated. Um, that is very gratifying and that's, I'll tell you what, that's one of the biggest parts of the job. Um, that, it, it, you know, uh, taking care of the people of your district is why you sent me to Springfield. And that is what is going to continue to go on in the next General Assembly when you send me back there then. Thank you. And Brian Sager. Well, first, I do want to extend my sincere gratitude uh, to Representative Wright for his service on behalf of the district over the last couple of terms. I also want to just uh, assure him, as well as all of the listeners, that I'm very aware relative to ethics of the uh, legislative inspector general. But I think Mr. Wright made exactly the point that I was trying to make, and that is that it is too tied up with politics. There were concerns about elected, uh, a legislative inspector general not being appointed. If you were to move that oversight out of the legislature, away from that situation and into the attorney general's office, I think that's a much greater policy approach. And that's what I would support in that regard. Why should I be elected uh, as the state representative from the 63rd district? I've been the mayor of the city of Woodstock for nearly 16 years now. And throughout that tenure, I have worked incredibly hard with some absolutely fantastic individuals who are both hired and those who are serving in public service uh, to make sure that we are constantly listening to our uh, residents and our businesses, understanding what the challenges are, making sure that we acknowledge where they believe we need to seek change and where they believe that we need to grow the opportunities. We engage individuals. We have 15 boards and commissions within the city of Woodstock that allow for individuals to participate in their local government and to give input. It is through that outreach and through that collaborative effort that we are able to uh, be, move forward in a very positive manner to support our community and to address the needs that we have. I'm proud of that record. I believe that uh, residents, businesses, voters today are incredibly concerned about the agonism and extreme partisanship which has uh, taken place at multiple levels of government. And they are looking for elected leaders to say that the most important job that we have is to come together at the table to discuss those areas that we believe are the primary bottom line uh, common interests and then to start to address those areas where we have differences of opinion to provide a sense of collective and collaborative resolution to move forward in a positive manner to deal with these incredibly challenging and difficult issues that exist before us today. Whether that is our state financial situation, whether that is addressing further the COVID pandemic or any pandemic in the future as far as that goes, whether it is to deal with our pension systems, funding education and reducing local property taxes. People expect us to come together to address these things. That's what I've done throughout my political career in the city of Woodstock. And that's what I pledged that I would do if I had the opportunity to uh, represent this absolutely fantastic 63rd district of the state of Illinois. I want to thank you all for this opportunity today. I'm truly grateful and we look forward to uh, addressing any further questions that individuals might have if they want to give me a call. Thank you. That concludes today's interview. I wanna thank all the candidates in the 63rd and 64th districts for their time and participation. Good luck on your campaigns. The election's November 3rd, early voting begins September 24th. That will include mail-in voting this year. We encourage all voters to research the candidates and issues in all the races and to make use of the Daily Herald at dailyherald.com and of Shaw Media at shawmediaillinois.com as part of that research. Ultimately, informed voting is one of the most sacred obligations a citizen has if a democracy is to flourish. Thank you for watching and stay well.